So good morning. So we are going to continue on uh, PGP. So my, I, as usual, I ask you if you have some questions what we have seen yesterday. And as usual, you say that everything was clear. Yes. Okay. Uh, but if it's not clear, don't hesitate to to ask. So, now we are going to, to look at uh, BGP, BGP protocol, but before we, we have to designate what I call during the previous classes a domain. In fact, what is a domain? It is an area where you know the password of all the routers. So you can configure everything here, but and you interact, interact with another domain. On, on this domain, of course, you don't have any control, direct control on the routers. So it means that here you can send, of course, BGP messages, and this message will have an impact on the other domain. But break all the record. <laughs> I will have to edit the video. <laughs> so uh, you can send information uh, with BGP to control things here to give information, but you cannot log on this computer on, on this router. You just here, because it's another provider, another company that manages. So, here, it's very difficult to designate a domain with an IP prefix. Because you may have here different prefixes that belong to your company. So, it's not so obvious to use that. So, we have to introduce a new way to designate a domain. And we will not call this, this now anymore a domain, but we will create a new acronym, and this acronym will be Autonomous System. Autonomous System, or AS, means that you are autonomous, it means that you can manage your things alone, without the help of other people. And when you are an autonomous system, you will get from uh, the same authority as the authority that gave you a prefix, you will get an autonomous system number, or ASM, that will be used to designate you on the network. So we are going to, to see here this. Um, um, so, we are going to see how we can uh, look at this autonomous system number. So currently, or uh, one year ago, it was an autonomous system number was on 16 bit. But since nowadays there is some lack of 16 number for a 16 bit number for autonomous system, now this uh, value can be coded on 32 bits. When you will see value higher than 65,000, it's private autonomous system. It means, for example, you are a company and you are not a transit provider. It means that you're just connected to one uh, ISP. So here you can use a private number. These private numbers allows you to do BGP because BGP will use IS number to exchange information. So you have your private number. But here, this information, this IS number will be filtered by UISP. And for the rest of the world, it would like, it would like, it will be like your ISP send directly the information. So it's uh, also something very useful. We see that, that kind of thing. So as for anything on the internet, domain name, IP addresses, there is some databases that can give you information 
regarding autonomous systems. So this is the WIS database, and on the WIS database, you can get information about a domain, an autonomous system. We are going to see some, uh, some examples. And uh, here we will see, but we will find in the WIS database the strategy of the ISP to exchange things with other ISPs. So here you, you will see the politics of this ISP. So normally, if I go, for example, to whoisright.net, right is European, so I will have only information regarding Euro European uh, ISP. If I go to that one, whois.ra.net, I will have information concerning any IS, but only IS, in, uh, in the world. So we are going to, to see an example. So I'm going to try to do it also. With.ra.net. With an IS to end. Okay. So here I have the information concerning this IS number. 2200. So what gives me uh, this information here? I know that this size belongs to a French ISP called Renater. And here I have a description of this company. It's Réseau National de Telecommunication pour la Technologie d'Enseignement et la Recherche. <laughs> so it's a way for you to, to learn French. And it's in France. Then I have here the politics to import information from other ISIS. Here I have the policy to export information to other ISIS. And here I have some people I can contact if I need more details or if I have a problem with this ISIS. So here you see that the long the query here is given here with database with and the number and the answer is something that is very object oriented. It means that here in the first column I have the type of the line. So here it's export, here it's import, here it's autonomous autonomous system number, it's the right term. So this can be used by humans but also by uh, programs to analyze the information. And then here I have also a description, for example, of import things or export things, and they are also using a language to describe how I exchange. This is not really, a, it's not text like this, free text, it's something that is a structure. So here, if I receive something from IS. Uh, 75.00, then the action is to put a preference and accept only information concerning S75.00. So here is the language, it's what we call RPSL for routing specification, uh, routing language Routing policy specification language. So, I got the information uh, online. I have a copy here. I think it's almost the same as what we, we have seen online. It didn't change that much. So, now we are going to try to understand what does it mean and what is the strategy of uh, Renater about peering with other ACs. So, we are going to focus on import and then to export. So, here I will present the Renater network in the middle. You see that you have green part here. These green parts are uh, ACs 
But uh, belonging to Renater too, we are going to see them in uh, or just connected to Renater, and we are going to, to see them when we are going to see uh, all the land. So here, what it says is said, from AS Renater, accept everything, and here you have a very strange uh, command. In fact, it's uh, regular expressions. So like when you type ls on a computer, you can type ls star dot txt and you get all the files with txt. Here it says that everything must start with as renater and as something as well. So for example, renater has some other companies, for example, uh, we can imagine that uh, research center has its own AS, but is only connected to Renater. So in that case, we will accept this. And we have another place we are going to see uh, in the following slide how it is done, but it's called a global exchange point, where all the provider comes to a change on traffic. So here it's called AS Things, AS Things Peers. And the number of x peers is this one. And here you also accept things that start with x peers, one of these numbers. And so you accept this, uh, this information. Here I have another one which is Géant. And Géant is the, uh, the European network that interconnect a research center or research for a network. So like Abilene in the US, in, in Europe we have this, uh, this network. So what do we see now is that Renater here is connected to Géant. And Géant, maybe, can be connected to a German equivalent of Renater. Okay, we don't see it here because we just focus on that. But I will use this example after. So, Géant will do all the job for Renater to interconnect with other countries like Germany. But if I want to go also to the US on the educational network, I will go, go through JL for educational research. Now, if I want to go to the US or to Mexico to you and use go to some commercial sites, then I will use two other providers. One is cable and wireless and the other is the, the, the level 3. So what does it mean? It means that Renater is also buying some connectivity from cable and wireless and from level 3 and this way, for example, you can go to the US. So here we see um, one, one problem, for example, so here it's for academics. So, when a German researcher wants to go to a site in France, the German researcher, of course, will go through Géant and will go to Renater to get the connectivity, to get the information. Now, the German researcher wants to go to the US. What we would like to avoid is that the German researcher go to Renater and then leave, go through cable and wireless, and use the resource, resource by, bought by Renater. Because here it will increase the traffic. What we would like to have is that the German researcher use research bought by the German research and education network. So, how we can avoid that? 
is by dying. It means that for a French user, we will import all the routes from the US. So this way, I can go through Cable and RDS to go to the US. But when I will inject the route I know from Renater to Géant, I will filter and I will not send the US route. And if I don't send, send this US route, it means that I have no way from Géant to say I can go to the US. And this way, by filtering the route, just giving our route, then German people will not know about the, the French way to go to the US, and we will not have transit traffic, so that. Now, if you have a company, for example, in Ria, which is a research center in, in France, has a connection with Renater. And here, of course, in Ria will give its route to Renater. And here it's to totally uh, in conformance with the politic of Renater to be a transit provider to Inria. So in this case, we will send route from Inria to the Géant uh, network. And this way, when a German chercher wants to go to Inria, he will know this path. He will know that he can send it to Géant, then to Renater, and then to Inria. So here, you have to be very aware of what you are sending. We saw it yesterday as a stupid example, where you inject all the information in your network and then you became a transit provider. But here it's the same. You have to be very careful of what you are sending on the network, because if you send too much information, then you can carry too much traffic on your, on your network. So, here we have all the import. Now, what we are going to say is that the over here, what we get from the over is that this one inject everything on my network. So this way, I can learn about all the prefix available. To here, to Sphinx, I will just I'll give my prefixes on the prefixes of ISP or a company like Inria. So this way, these people here will just be able to contact me, and only me. They cannot, for example, some member of the Sphinx here cannot go to Géant using because I don't announce the route from Géant here. Etc. etc. So Géant will announce my route, so I will give it to me and to my uh, to the over uh, system, etc. etc. So this way you can define your policy. So here I have the policy of Renater. You see that the policy of Renater is very simple. Now we can have a look to, for example, S 2965. And here, 2965. And here I have the policy of Géant to import and export rules. So here, sorry, sorry, the other one, I've lost my mouse. So here you have Jean, so it's the same thing. We have the ice number, you have the name, and you have a description, and you have some remarks that you can read if you want. And then you have import things. So here you see you have Jean is connecting a lot of networks, a lot of ISPs, so here of course you have something much more complex.
And here, for example, you have import from Renater 2200, and you see that they accept, as we have seen, AS Renater and the other one, AS uh, 65. So here, the import uh, strategy, I have lost it, but it's here. The import strategy is the same as the export strategy from Geant to that network. So here we will have no problem because we agree on the same rules. If he didn't agree on the same rule, if Renater was sending much more things than Geant was configured to accept, so Geant will filter what is not, uh, what will not accept. So Renater will filter and Geant will filter also. And for the export, we will have the same, so we will send all this information to all these groups. So we will find again, maybe, uh, in, no, because it will be on, let me see if we have it, but normally not, because it's a general politics to different ISP and we have a more global rule to describe. But here you see, we, we have the, the description here and of course, for this provider, it's more complex. So we are going to see uh, in more detail the, this kind of thing. But what we can do also is to understand better this notion of ISs. We can try to use uh, a trust route program, a modified trust route program. So you remember what is trust route? I am sending here I am with IPv4 but it's the same with IPv6. I am sending a packet with time to leave to a direction to destination but I put time to leave equal to 1. So, here I receive an ICMP message with things that the time I expire or the limit I expire. And this ICMP message is included in an IP message. So, I look at the source address of this IP message and I get the IP address of this router. So, now that I have the IP address of this router. Then I can query DNS. By querying DNS, I have the name of the router. So normally the name will contain some geographical information. Will contain also to which provider this IP address belongs. And this is a traditional transfer. What I can do here also is to ask the GUI database. I ask GUI that with database and GUI database will give me the IS number of the address. So this way, when I do a trust route, I have more information than with uh, a traditional uh, trust route. So, here we have a trust route to go to Korea. We'll try after that to, to make a, a trust route to, uh, to Mexico, or you will try to, to do it. So, here we have the first router, which is a router from Telecom Rotary. So here I can, when I read the name, I see nstbrotime.fr. So it's old name of Telecom Brotime. And here I have the IP address of the router. But here I have the IS of Telecom Brotime. You can tell me that this is not the IS of Telecom Brotime. Of course, it's not the IS of Telecom Brotime, it's the IS of Renata. But since we have only one provider, as I said, we are using private IS number, and after that, it's viewed as a 
certain number of prefix that denotes to renamed. And the round trip time is very, very quick because we are just, we are just on the same local area network. Then the second router doesn't answer, maybe because he has some private addresses, so he cannot send me a packet because he has his private addresses. But the third router tells me that I am in the Renatier network, by the name here, and here I have the city, so it's Caen. So you can look at the map of France, and you can locate uh, where is this city. And if I look here, I have also a nice number, and the nice number is 222. Oh, sorry, 2200. So, please give me but I have not changed my eyes, I am still in Renate Network. And after that, I have something strange here. It's that my trust route, in fact, I am in an MPLS network. So Renate is an MPLS network. So what did I do? I enter in MPLS network. And I, so I put my TTL for example, equal to 2. So what happens when you enter into your MPLS network? So you create a label. A label has a value here. And here, the TTL is copied from the IP layer. So here, the TTL is equal to 1, because I have crossed this router. Then I send my packet adds the MPLS label to the next LSR, to the next MPLS router, and here, this value will be put to zero. So here, it cannot switch the frame forward. So here, he answer me with an ICMP message, packet too big, uh, time to leave, expire. And here, this ICMP message contains the label value. So here I know that in, I am in the MPLS network and that the label well, which was used was 227. Next time I arrive in Rouen, so you can look in my map of France where is Rouen, so I'm still in the network, I am still at 2200 on MPL, MPLS network. Then, fifth router, I arrive in Paris, so you know where, where is Paris, so you don't have to look at one map. And here I'm still in the Alter network, IS 222. But, and did you see that the time to go from my computer to this router is very low, it's about 7 milliseconds. And here I look at the fifth router, so it's called Renater, but in fact it belongs to Géon. And we can see it because the IS number is totally different, it's 21965. So here the delay are very low because I am still in Paris, so we can imagine that the bar here is from Paris. And then I arrive at router 7, and router 7 shows me that I am still in Géant, same as number, but here I am in London. And here I have 14 milliseconds because it takes more time to cross the channel. Then I come back to uh, continental Europe because after that I'm going to Amsterdam, but I am still on Géant network. So here we have Renater, here we have Géant, and then I arrive in Internet 2. So here Internet 2 means that I am in the US. If I look at this address, this real trip time, it was 20 seconds, now I have 106 seconds, milliseconds. So it means that here I have crossed the Atlantic. And here I have no information regarding the S number, but looking here at 
this prefix, mm -hmm. I know that I am in Internet 2. So here I am in uh, New York, normally, if I look at the name here, and here I am in Chicago. So here I have transited to the US, and then I arrive to something, uh, I think still in the US, with IS number 1237. So here I am in, and all of these routers belong to the same IS. So here I am in Korea. In fact, here I think I'm still in the US because the road trip time is not so much increased, but here I have three minutes, uh, 300 milliseconds. So it means that here I have crossed Pacific. So I am in Korea, so in this access network, so Korea, uh, Korea net. And then, last point is that here I arrive in the network of KAIST University with here another IS number. And here I have still around 300 milliseconds to, uh, to go to Korea. So, what is important to notice is that I have crossed 18 routers, but I have crossed only 5 IS. Okay? So, I propose you to try to do the same with your uh, computer. So, try now to make a trust route with, uh, with, for example, France and see the path taken by a packet from ITAM to, let's say, www.rand. Dot telecom dot Okay, you do this first route and you try to analyze all the IC tomorrow. So I'm gonna try I don't know if I don't think I have my the trust route here. <laughs> You don't have the same result? So, we can have a look. If I do trust root www.ren.telecom mutine.eu So here it will take time, not because my trust route is doing a lot of things, but in fact, I got an answer normally from the first router, and I try to solve the name. So I am calling the DNS to ask, what is the name of this? And since I have no answer, the trust route takes time to display. So we can speed up the process by, for example, typing trust route dash n, and this way, this way I will have no name uh, resolution. So I will just have IP addresses. But here I will do it uh, with them, but maybe because sometimes with luck, maybe we will have some numbers. Uh, Take a little bit more time. Do you agree with the three first values? Okay, so what do we have here? If we look at addresses, you see here you have the ETAM class B, 148, 205, and then different numbers. And if you look at the time here, it's very small. So here we are in the ETAM network. So here we arrive to a gateway between UNAM and Internet. Internet. So here we are still in Mexico, 
and it also is one uh, is the delay of very low. But we can say that this is highest number from the time. I guess that here we will have highest number from the time. And then I am in an open network, and here I am in Internet 2 network. So here I am crossing the US. I have no information here regarding uh, where we are. But we are going to the US, and here I go from 84 milliseconds to 164. Here it means that I have crossed the Atlantic. I arrive to London. Here. Uh, I have some, some point here where I am in Internet 2 in London. Then, and here I am still in London, but I am with Jean. So from, the US, from London, I go to Paris. And in Paris, I go from Jean Network to Renate. So here I am still in Jean Network. I arrive in Jean Network close on the router. That is located in Renate, but belongs to Géant. And then now I enter into the Géant network, the Renate network, and I go to Rouen, Caen. Here I have no information, but here, after that, I am in Telecom Protein network. And you see that the IP address is always the same because normally, maybe here, I have a firewall that always me to get more information and going further. So my trust route blocks here. And normally, so to go to Brittany, it's here almost, I have 21 routes. Okay, because after that, you have here X, X and X is filtering by file. So it's an ICMP message that has generated this. So now we can do the, we are very lucky because I have an account in REN, but now I am connected to, to, to REN, and I will do a transport to www.itam.mx. And we are going to see the route from REN. So here I am in REN, So, what can you say about this route? So, in fact, when I leave Mexico to France, we are both academical. So, we took the academic path. AUNAM, Internet 2, Géant, Renate. And here, on the other path, I am not using the academical network. In fact, here, if you look at the path, I start the same way because here I have no, not a lot of possibilities. So I go to, uh, I leave Telecom Portal, then I enter into the Renate network, so Renate, Renate, Renate. I arrive in Paris, but and then from Paris I arrive in Lyon. So I go to Lyon. And here I change my network from Renater to level 3. And in level 3, I go back to Paris. And from Paris, I go to Frankfurt. And Frankfurt, so here you see 22 seconds. Then I arrive in Washington, always in level 3 network. But here I have 112 seconds, milliseconds. So it means that I have crossed the Atlantic. So I continue in level 3 network. So I Travel the US, Washington, Atlanta, Houston. And in Houston, I have a peering with another Vestel, so it's a Mexican provider. And from Vestel, I arrive to Atitan. So you see that here we have a totally asymmetric route. When you send a packet, you do a ping to REN. Your packet goes on the academic network and comes back using the commercial network. That means that you have no symmetry on the route. 
And it's very, very, very rare that you get a symmetrical root in both ways. Normally, the return path is totally different from the, the path to go to that to a direct direction, to a destination. So, here, of course, you can, I have not installed in my computer, but you can download the special class root, and you will have the highest number that will be uh, So, as I said, it's a problem, because if it doesn't work, then you have to test one way and the other. Now, as we have seen all this, we, we are ready to, to study in more detail BGP. So BGP is a quite old protocol that has been designed when Internet loses its flat architecture. So at the beginning, when the first Internet network we have designed, You had a core backbone, a single core backbone, and you have every site that were connected to this core backbone. So here routing was very, very simple because you just have to talk to your core backbone and give you root and the core backbone can talk to you. And this was the first version, first architecture of internet. And after that, Instead of one unique backbone, we get we got this graph of provider and you have to exchange traffic between this provider and you have to take into account routing policy. So BGP has been introduced for that and so is D to define the interface between two ways. So, first thing when you do that, you are talking with a Devo because you are talking with a competitor. So it means that you don't want to give a lot of information regarding your network to your competitor. You just want to give the minimum set of information that are necessary to do interconnection. So, in BGP, we will concentrate all of the information. But we will have also to add to an attribute, for example a prefix, we will have to add a lot of, uh, sorry, we have a prefix, and we will add to add attribute that helps to manage a prefix. And we are going to, to see how it works. So, BGP that we use many years ago, was BGP4 version. And in fact, we tried to, to have a version 5 of BGP when we developed uh, IPv6. Because you will see that BGP is outcoded for IPv4. So we have fields that are 32 bit long, so you cannot put IPv6 on it. So it was the first attempt to make a BGP for IPv6. And people try to call it BGP5. And the big router manufacturer said, no, we cannot call BGP5, call it BGP5, because our customer, for the provider, were uh, so, had too much trouble when they moved from BGP3, BGP3 was before Cider, to BGP4 that include uh, hierarchical addresses. So the change of version was very, very difficult and it created a lot of problems on the internet. So that's why when work start with BGP on IPv6, the version of BGP was called BGP4+. Because this way we continue to call it version 4 and providers were not afraid by, by this. So, it means that people are very conservative, but things evolve. So it means that now, from BGP4, we have a new version of a protocol, because BGP4 
can carry only IPv4, and the new version of BGP is called multi protocol BGP. And we have a smooth evolution from BGP4 to multi protocol BGP. So I will show you this, uh, this evolution. So, multi protocol can handle IPv6, MPLS. So we will talk a lot about these two, two things. And we'll talk also about multicast. I will not work a lot about that. But if we have MPLS, then we will see the link with VPN. So, but the principles are almost the same. So if we look at the protocol, we took about uh, one day to explain OSPF, to see all the protocol. In BGP, it's very, very simple. In BGP, it's based on TCP. So that's strange. If you look at B, if you look at OSPF, if you look at IS to IS, they are using multicast. So since they use multicast, they are on UDP. And multicast is used to discover the neighbors. <coughs> Here, as I told you, we don't want to discover the neighbors because we have to tell to which neighbor we want to talk. We, we want to talk. So it's a point-to-point -point communication between two equipment that know each other and that are configured to talk each other. It means that you configure. I have to talk with this one, and you say, I accept communication from the other one. So you have this double check. And TCP is a good protocol because TCP, if you lose a packet, you can recover it automatically by TCP. You don't have to put this mechanism into BGP, which makes BGP much more simple. Then, when you open your, your TCP connection, then you are going, going to exchange BCP, uh, BGP messages. So there is only four messages. One is open. Open is used to agree an autonomous system number. So it means that I, am, I want to talk with this router, but this router has to be on this autonomous system number. If it's not the case, then you will close the connection, you will reset the connection. And on multi-protocol uh, BGP, we will also discuss what protocol, what uh, capability we can use. For example, are you supporting IPv6? Yes, I am. Okay, so we can exchange traffic on IPv6. Are you supporting IPv6? No. Okay, we will never talk about IPv6. I will never talk about IPv6. So we have this exchange of what we can do more than just basic IPv4. So here, after that, when you are open your connection between the two uh, peers, then you can send the update or update of your database. It means new prefixes that arrive and all the prefix that you have to suppress from the network. So prefix that you add will contain also some attributes that will give you more information regarding BGP uh, protocol. On withdraw, you just say, I'm suppressing this protocol, this uh, prefix. Then you have a notification, for example, if you have an error message, something that goes wrong, so you will tell it. And you have keep alive. It means that periodically, you will just send a message to check that the other is still active. So, in fact, the main message is update. So we are going to, to see how it works. So here, I have, if you look at what is on the blackboard, I represent uh, uh, NAS with a cycle. So this is a NAS. So, at the BGP level, we have a kind of meta router. It means that my IS is viewed as only one router. 
And I am talking with over what? With only one root. So that's the model of BG. But if I look in more detail, this model doesn't work. Because if I am, a, I am a provider and I have only one router and I put all my links on that router, my network will be too simple and I will have a lot of traffic that goes, for example, I will put one router in Mexico, in Mexico City, and all the links will have to go to Mexico. So that's stupid. So here it's just a representation for BGP, but in fact I will have to cut this router in small part, and in fact, this router, this part, will be the provider edge of my network, and I will have some routers in the middle, my P router, that allow me to have an interconnection. So, here we are going to see this example. So, when you are talking with your neighbors, so your neighbors can be your customers or other ISPs, so you will use BGP and it will be from a private provider edge to another customer. Maybe here you have P root. So what you will do then, since I have not only one router in the middle of my network, but I have routers around my network, so I have to exchange the information I have learned on this PE to the other one to, to, to allow all the routers to have the same vision of my network. So in fact I have two BGP protocols. One which is called external BGP. An external BGP will allow me to talk with other ISs. So if I look here, normally I have my PD and I'm doing here external BGP with another router, another domain. So external BGP means that the IS number are different because it's two different companies that exchange information using external BGP, but here I have a list line. I have something that makes interconnection between my two companies. So normally it's a link that I have bought to make the, the communication. So since it's a link here, we share some prefix. So I will have alpha.1 here and alpha.2 here. So same prefix, different autonomous system number. Now, if I look at IBGP, so IBGP will be inside my autonomous system. And don't forget that we have in the middle P routers. These P routers make that this router, for example, the router on the right, on the left, bottom left, and the router on the upper side of the uh, right are not in the same prefix because I have P router in the middle so here I will have two different prefixes and I will need routing to allow communication between these two equipment. So they are not on the same prefix but they are on the same autonomous system number. So if you are on the same autonomous system number, it's what we call IBGP. So what is very important to understand is to make the difference between IGP and IBGP. Okay? Because here, between two PE here, inside your IS, it's a TCP connection. Okay? So P router doesn't know the content of what you are changing. You open the connection between these two PE and you are sending packets. So the P router 
just forward the packets, but don't look inside. So if I learn a prefix here, I will tell it to V over P is. So V over P is will know it, but P router will not know it. Okay? Because it just doesn't go inside the packet and look what is the information. Because the goal here is just to forward the packet from P one P to another. So what we have to do also when I learn something here, I have to tell it to all the other pieces. So I will have a full mesh of TCP connection. So here, for example, I have, I have four PEs, so I have three TCP connections for this PE, two for this one, and one for the last one. So the number of connections will be six. Okay? But if I have much more routers, I will have much more TCP connections. So of course it's not very equal because it's a, in the order of the square of the number of PE, and we will see some techniques to reduce this number of period internally with IDG. So, to make things nicer, see, lot of colors, it's better, we are going to see the interaction with all the other plans we have seen. So in green, we have our uh, IGP plan, and in blue, we have our forwarding plan. So you see the premise is the following. I learned from the EBG, external BGP, EBGP, I learned the prefix. So this PE router knows the prefix. He will tell it to the other PE. P. So this PE will learn about the prefix. Now, when I want to forward packets, how can I do it? Here, all PE are aware, but P router are not aware. So what can I do? One possibility is to use my IGP, so OSPF, for example, to flood this information into my network and to create a shorted path tree to that router that no learned about this prefix. And so using my IGP, I will be able to populate routers in the middle with the knowledge of that prefix. Of course, it's not the best solution because here my P, my P router will have to learn 350,000 volts. So my external router, my PA router, already have to know it because they have to know the complexity of the world. But it's stupid to give this complexity of the world inside my network. And that's why it's better to use MPLS, for example, to reduce the number of entries you will put. But now, forget about MPLS, we'll see that in the future. Just look at one, one inter possible interaction between BGP and IGP. And then, since your IGP has populated P routers, then you can put the route to alpha on the feed of all the routers. So when you a packet arrive for alpha, you have the path established on your domain. Okay? So, that becomes a little bit more complex, of course, because we have now three plans, but we may have more plans when we will introduce MPLS, for example, in the middle. So, we will see that. Out. So, one important thing also is that here, when I learn about prefix alpha, I inject this prefix alpha on my IGP, and of course, all the routers will learn about it, and all the PE routers are part also of the IGP protocol, and will learn through OSPF, for example, the existence of the prefix. So, what is totally forbidden is to re inject 
this prefix to BGP. Because here, when I put my prefix from BGP to IGP, I have lost all the attributes of BGP. So it means that it becomes a prefix, but without a prefix learned from BGP. So if I reject it on BGP, I will have some trouble. So that's why when I want to send the information, the knowledge of a prefix to another PE, I will use IBGP because on IBGP I will continue to carry the attribute learned by BGP. And then I will be able to send the, pref the knowledge of the prefix on all the attributes that I've learned before and I may have modified on my S. So, we are going to see an example of configuration example. So here it comes from a Cisco router. So what do I say? I say, I will start router BGP. So it means that uh, here I start a routing process of BGP and then here I give my autonomous system number. So here, what's the particular ID of 65102? Yes? Okay, it's a private S number. So it will be removed by my neighbors, my over ISP, when it will process the attribute. And then what do I say here? I want my neighbors, it means that the over BGP router I want to talk to is this IP address and its remote AS is 2200. So are we going to have IBGP or EBGP? IBGP is internal BGP and EBGP is external BGP. Who say I? Who say E? Okay, who say nothing? Hmm? E BGP because the IS numbers are not the same. If they were the same, it will be I BGP. Okay, internal is when two PI of your domain talk each other. So here it will be the case, for example, if I have uh, 65, 1 or 2 here, and maybe I will I not share the same prefix. But here, what I know, but I have no information here, but I have no proof here, but it means that my IP address must be something like this, must share the same prefix. Because with eBGP, you have a dedicated, dedicated link between those two, your two routers. No, it's, it's a normal situation. Because, in fact, we are going to see that after, so when you are sending, you have a prefix here. So, your prefix will go on the IS, will go from IS to IS. And each time you cross an IS, you will add its IS number. So here I will have, for example, 665,102, and then I will add 222,000, and then I will add uh, 2965, uh, etc. Et so here will be the IS path, which means that all the IS I have crossed. And what I do when I'm using private addressing is that this one will remove the private IS number. And it would like I add this IS number, this IS, including my own network. So it will like it will it will look like I am issuing IS 2200 issues a packet. 
So it's what we saw in the trust route. And telecom, telecom Britain packets appears like a Renater. Telecom Britain address appears as a Renater address. Okay. So, we are going to, uh, to see now configuration. And first thing we are going to see, and something I didn't talk when I, I talk about ITPs, but in ITPs you, you may have the same, same thing. It's what we, we call the loopback address. So, in BGP it's more, it's easier to understand why we, we need a loopback address. So, you remember what we saw on the previous slide, which is that you have to tell to which router you call, you talk. So here I have two routers in my domain, my IS number, my IS, sorry, and I want to make an IBGP peering. So we are in the same IS number, and we are going to open a connection. So what can I say, for example, is this. Router BGP, so my IS number, 1234. I open, my neighbor is Delta 1, so I give the IP address of this interface, and we are, the remote IS is the same as mine, so it means that we are in IBGP. Okay? So I have selected to use this interface to do period. But suppose that Delta 1 fails. So, what can I do? So here this interface doesn't work anymore. Then I cannot continue to have this period. Because here I configure it with Delta 1. Of course I may have another way to go to this router is to use beta 1. But here I have said delta 1, so it's a hard configuration on my router. So I have a failure here. So I have to configure this router again to check the interface. So that's very boring if you are a network manager because this will happen at 2 in the morning and you will have to be wake up Wake up by your team to change the configurations. So you want something automatic. So the best approach is to have to give to each router what we call a loopback address. It means it's a slash added to an address that you will give to the equipment, not to the interface. Okay, so in IPv4 it will be a, a prefix with a length of slash 32. Or the full length and address. And you are going to inject this on your routing protocol, your IGP, internal uh, routing protocol. So it means that your internal routing protocol, we say, by example, to JAN Epsilon 2, I use Delta 1. So here you just inject and you do a chosen path 3 on this address and you are fine that this path is the best. Now, if Delta 1 disappears, then your routing protocol will find another way to join Epsilon 2 is to use Beta 1. So, in that case, you will change your path. And it's your IGP that will manage your, your, this path change. So you don't have to worry about it. It's done by your IGP. And since you are using Epsilon, so it's Epsilon 2 here, not Epsilon 1, but if you are using Epsilon 2 as an address, then it doesn't change, even if your routing is changing. So normally when you have a routing protocol, you will, of course, have to manually configure these interfaces, and you will learn the prefixes that are assigned to these prefixes, but you will add also a full address 
what we call a loopback address, that you will add to your configuration. It will be a slash 32. And this way, each router will have a single identity. And you inject that also in your IGP. So one of the interface will allow you to join this address. And it's the IGP that will decide which interface you will use. So if one interface fails, you will take another one. So, loopback address are very important for this kind of things. So now, a uh, big part of the class will be to study BGP attributes. So, we are going to have a list of attributes. We are going to see most of them right now to see how it works. And here, so you have attributes, the, list, the name of the attribute, and you have the RFC that gives you this, uh, how to use this attribute. And each attribute has a status. And this status can be mandatory. Mandatory means that you must find it in any announcement. So any announcement with BGP must have origin, as part, next. Then you have another attribute which is optional. Optional means that you don't have to put it in all the announcements. You may use it uh, sometime when you need it, and you can forget it when you don't need it. You have also a status that is well known. Well known means that every BGP router must know it. So, if you, it's not mandatory to use it, but if you use it, the other one has to understand this. And then you have another attribute, so for example, when it's mandatory, of course, it's well known. And you have another attribute which is transitive or not. So I put it like T or T bar. So what does it mean transitive? It means that when you send it to another IS, the other RS will continue to propagate it. When it's not transitive, you give it to the other RS, but the other RS will remove it from the attribute when you will send it to another RS. Okay? So, let's have a look to first how to open a BGP session between two things. So, on the left, you have old BGP4. On the right, you have new MPBG, multi protocol BGP. So, in any case, it starts with SYN, SYNAC, ACK. So, it means that you open a TCP connection between both sides. Then, you negotiate. In BGP4, you just give your ice number. The other give its ice number. If you have configured correctly, the ice number match and you accept things. If it doesn't match, you reset the connection. In multi protocol BGP, you will check the ice number, but you are going to check if your routers can do more than just pure. IPv4 packets. So you will have to negotiate capabilities, so extra functionalities that, that you don't find in BGP4. So, how it is done? This is done by negotiating two parameters. So I just give you here a few of these uh, parameters, but if you go to the link you have at the bottom of the page, you can see the other parameters. So normally you are negotiating, for example, if you can do multicast or your unicast IPv4, you will say, can you do multicast or uh, unicast IPv4? So it will be that it will be AFI value one and SAFI value one. Okay? See if you want to do unicast IPv6, so you will add also another 
attribute is, let's say, 2 for IPv6 and then 1 for Unicast. If you want to do MPLS on IPv4, then you will put 1 on 4, etc. etc. So you can describe what you can do on both sides. So what is important to notice, for example, if I do 1-1, one, one, IPv4 unicast, it means that I will not use the basic functionality defined in BGP4. So when I have IPv4, I have two ways to do it. One way is the old way, using a legacy equipment, or the other way is to do it on a la MPBGP. So you have two possibilities for uh, Unicast. So in your configuration file, you will see the difference. So if you lose the default parameter, it will be changed, exchanged using BGP4. And if you take care to, to give in your configuration file that you are using address family IPv4, then if you specify address family IPv4, you will use MPBGP way to exchange your information. So, once you have done that, in IPv4, in the BGP4, you have the attributes here. The attribute is a list of prefix you are removing for on the other side. So here, the router on the left tells the router on the right, remove this list of prefix because they have disappeared from the internet. And then, you have a list of prefix that you add. So, in fact, there is a very subtle difference and when I add something, I don't talk about the prefix. Because it will be too simple. So instead of saying a prefix, I will say a network layer reachability information. NNRI. So when I talk about NNRI, most of the time it's a prefix, but sometimes it's a little bit more than a prefix. So it's just to add confusion to, to students. But now you can say that I am using an NRI and you will be, people will believe you are an expert in, in NPS. And so you have an NRI and with this NRI you add, you have also some attributes that you will carry. So the problem with BGP4 is that prefix withdraw and NRI are designed to be a 32 bit. So here, this is very specific field. So here, you cannot put IPv6 because there is not enough room. The only thing that is very flexible is the path attribute because you can have different kinds of attributes and so you can do, uh, you have more flexibility. So what we do in multi-protocol BGP is to let the prefix withdraw list empty and NRI added empty because we are designed for IPv6 and instead we are going to create two attributes which can have a generic format and here, this attribute will be multi-protocol unreachability uh, network layer unreachability, uh, NRI. And here I will say the AFI, so it's IPv4, IPv6, it's unicast, it's multicast. So the parameter I have negotiated when I was opening the connection. And then I will put the prefix I want to remove. So if I have two here for IPv6 and one here, for any cast, then I will have a list here of IPv6 prefixes. And I have enough flexibility. And when I want to add things, so here I will have continue to have a list of path attributes that will be associated with the prefixes for the NRI I am sending. So I will continue to have this path attribute here. And I will put another attribute, multipath flexibility, where I will give the type of the prefix and the NRI here. 
on the next dog also, which uh, depend on the family. Okay, so this way I can add flexibility, but here is the extreme case, and um, during the transition period, you may have this list not empty, and this list here can carry some IPv4 information. But normally, if you select your camp and you succeed in negotiating multi protocol, then this list must be empty and everything must be located, all the information in the path array. So that was a very subtle way to make a smooth transition between BGP4, which was only designed for IPv4, to something much more generic that can announce a lot of things. Just as a look to these links, and you will see all the things you can do with, uh, with BGP. Yes? No? Okay. So, we have seen these two, uh, these two attributes. Now we are going to, to see some basic attributes that are common on so origin, ice pass, that are mandatory and we find everywhere. So, ice pass, we are going to see it in very big detail because it's a very important uh, parameter and it, uh, it is used originally to avoid loops in your system. I'm going to see in an example. But it's also used to, uh, to select the best route. Uh, here, okay, you have this, uh, this network. So this network is composed of ASA, three ISs, transit IS here, and ISB. Okay, so what do you do? You have a prefix in ISP. So this prefix is learned by IPGP. Your IS here will announce it and say, I am X, I have prefix X, and the attribute is the IS pass. So the list of IS that this announcement has crossed. So here it arrives to ISS. ISX will send now announcement for alpha, but will add information in the IS path. So it comes from A, then it goes to X. In fact, when you look, you look at the old table, you have X, the first one, and the origin is always at the end. So, but here we know that we cross A and X. It arrived here, on Y, and it arrived in Z. So, what happens here? ISX, so the announcement that goes from A to X will arrive in Z, and in Z you send it to Y. So the path will be A, X, Z, Z here, another path here, X send it to Y, and then to Z. Okay? Now, what do you do? Y will send is announcement. So here we send only the best. So there is two announcements here. One which is AX and the other which is AXZ. So you will add, take here only the best. So only the best means that here you are sending AXY to this one. Okay? So that's something that is important to notice when you receive multiple announcements from different eyes, you, you will not send three announcements in that example. You will only send the best. So here you take a decision. So it means that you don't have a lot of announcements because you just take the best, even if you are connected to 20 providers. You will not, you will have only one announcement to tell after to the rest of the world is the best one you have received. So here, the best 
will be here in terms of ice path length. So this ice path you see is 3, the other one will have been 4. So I just send the shorter one. So here I take a routing decision which is to minimize the number of ice I cross. So normally it should minimize the number of router records. But there is no relation between these two things. Maybe this path is very, very long, and this one was very short in terms of router. But not a decision. So, first thing, ice path will help you to select the path. Other thing that is very useful is to avoid loops. So here, I can continue to announce this to the rest of the world. For example, here, I will say there is an ice which is A, X, Z, 1. So A, to that here, Z, X, 1. So I announce it here also. And if I do that, I can create a loop. Because this one can take the prefix, then re announce it to the rest of the world, and the announcement will loop forever. Here it will not be the case because AX will find its name on the prefix list. No, oh, sorry, the ice path list. Since it sees its name, it will not forward the prefix again. Or even take it into account because it's Oh, my name is already here, so I have already seen this thing before, so I don't have to take it to process it. Okay, so IcePass has two properties. One is to select the best path in terms of number of ice you cross, and the other one is to avoid loops. Now this, this thing to select a nice path or path just on the number of eyes may be totally stupid. Because this metric is totally artificial. It's you divide the internet in pieces and you cross the number of pieces, you look, you count the number of pieces you are crossing. But for example, I don't know the bandwidth. Maybe the bandwidth is very limited here. But the number of files is limited is smaller. So I will select a path with a very small bandwidth. Or this path is overloaded. Or this path is not overloaded. But it's not something taken into account by BGP. It's just the number of files you cross. So you can play with this number. And sometimes you can add several times the same OS number on your list. And you will say, for example, the OS path will be A, X, 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 Y. So here it means that increase OS X has increased artificially the size of the OS path. What the interest of this say, don't use it. But not totally don't use it. It's don't use it if you have no better alternative. So it means that if I have a better choice, I will not use this one. If I have not over choice, then this one exists and I will use it. So you can start playing with the network and say I prefer this provider and this one. So we say that we can filter the information and say I don't send it to this one. But if you want to take this one as a backup, then you can say, this is not a good choice, but if there is no other choice, take it. And so we will increase artificially the size of the ice path. So we are going to, to see an example for that. So, this is things we can do. So ice path is a very, very important parameter. It's a mandatory parameter. And a lot of traffic engineering in the, in the internet is done using this, uh, this application. 
So, you have another attribute, which is very strange, it's a mandatory attribute, so we have to put it on, on the network. But, it tells you the origin, how you get, how this prefix arrived in the network. So it was in the early days on the internet when you had the IGP. Is in, remember, I told you that at the beginning of the internet we had only one uh, interconnection network, and all the sites were connected to the inter interconnection network. And we moved some, something flat to a graph. But it was not done in one day. So it means that some sites continue to be on the flat addressing plan. And over we were on the on the graph. So and the problem is that it creates loops if you don't take care about things. So that's why we have an origin. Let's say, is it something that comes originally from BGP? And strangely, you will have an E for IGP. Or is it something from the old protocol that we have before, EGP, external gateway protocol? which cannot confuse with the family of protocol and or something else. So now you will find on the I and say that it comes from BGP. And now there is not very this attribute is no more very useful, but you find it on all your management since it's not that So we have seen this and here we can see an example from a router in Canada. So I asked for, so it's a Cisco router, and I type the command show IP BGP. So I want to look into the uh, BGP table and look for this prefix that belongs to France 2 uh, Telecom router. So 192, 108, 119. So what say this routing table in Canada? First, you see that there is no aggregation of the prefix. It appears as is in the BGP table of this router in Canada. So here they say that there is three possibilities. One is to go through that IS 74, 74, 74, 73, 12, 73, and 202, uh, 22, 00. So you know this, uh, this value, now it's an attack. The other one we don't know, we can have a look. And if you look here, so it's Office Communication, Singapore Telecom, Cable and Wireless, and Renate. So here, for this one, we have only, so 74, 73, so Singapore Telecommunication, then uh, Cable and Wireless, and then Renate. Okay? So what we will do here is to select by default the route which has the shortened IS pass. And what, I, what attribute I will include also is the next stop. So next next stop tells me to which router I have to send the packet. So here since I have selected this route, I know that to join the prefix from this machine, I have to send it to vast equipment. Okay? So, here I know how to go to the next provider. And if you look at the origin, it says that it comes from BGP. So, it says here that I am selecting this route. We are going to, I just give you some few details about next stop. In fact, the behavior of next stop is much more complex than just the next stop. It's something very tricky, but it's very useful and we can also do a lot of nice things using this kind of next stop attribute. And I will show you after. So, now we are going to, ah oh yes. Just one point. I forget to talk about this one. IS4 pass. 
As I told you, we are going to have a penury also of uh, IS number. So there is a move now to move from IS in 16 bits to IS in 32 bits. So if you are using 32 bits, so you don't have, you cannot use this one, and you have to use this attribute. So now we are going to see two other attributes before the break. So the first one is med or multi-exit discriminator, and the other one is break. This one allow you to make good routing decision into your IS or between IS. They are not very efficient, or they are somewhat efficient, but not as efficient as extending the IS. But we are going to see how it works. So, MED, multi-exit discriminator, is used when you want to talk with another IS. And for example here, between ISB and ISY, I have two paths. One has a lot of bandwidth, and the other one is a backup path. So what I will say, I will say the prefix, and I will say the med is 10 here, to say it's better than this one. If this link fails, the ISP link fails, then I will just have med 20, and this way you will send the traffic on the other one. So it can be used for two reasons. For example, you have a backup link and you say, okay, I use this uh, link instead of the other. But you can also load the, the share between two links. Two links, it means that you can send here one some of your prefix in your network with MET 10 here, and the other one with MET 20. And you do the opposite on the other link. Which means that this way, your traffic will be split on the two links. So this is also a, a possibility with MET. But be careful with MET because it works only if the IS path is the best. For example, here I add MED 5 to the prefix I'm announcing to uh, IZ, and here MED 5 to was the same prefix and it's in from Z to Y. But here, ISY will not select the path going through Z because this path is longer than the direct path. So the path length is more important than the med. The med will just be used when the IS path is the same. Another situation is when you want to, uh, to do things internally. So MED is just a way to do things with your neighbors. To announce to your neighbor, okay, this thing is better than this one. And you take the decision. It's not based on some physical value. It's you that give uh, a value, abstract value to one link or another. But internally, for example, here you want to send traffic to a destination, for example, alpha, which is on, post, on IS8. So you remember, on that graph, you receive announcement for alpha coming from ISY and coming from SD. And you will like Internally, you know that it's better to send traffic to alpha going through Z because you know that there is more bandwidth here than to Z than bandwidth going through Y. So, here, how we can do that? It's to configure internally a new message that a new uh, add an attribute to IBGP, but save here in my local pref. So here, for example, this one will announce my local pref is 30. 
This one we say my local press is 20, and this one we say my local press is 10. So here, in MED, it was the smallest value that made the highest priority. In uh, local press, is the highest value that makes the highest priority. So just to complicate things. So, what does it mean? It means that now, these three routers, that are here, located here, receive announcement with an nice pass. Here you overload the IS pass and you configure manually that the traffic should have to go to that to that end. And so over when you do IPGP, you make a, you send your traffic and say okay, my mine is 30. So you, this one you say mine is 30. So both of them here will know that there is someone that is stronger than them. So they will not continue to announce the traffic and they will not inject it in the IGP. Here, this one is a winner, so we'll inject into the IGP the prefix, and all the traffic will go to that router for, the, uh, for alpha, and then, of course, since it arrived to the router, then it will be sent to the Okay? And, for example, this one, also, if you are peering with other side, so we have a link here, that go to another site, then the next stop you will select will be this one because you know that it's the best one. Okay, so this is used internally in an S if you want to uh, have this router for these prefixes the exit way to this destination, even if you receive some information here. Okay? So we are going to have a break right now.